would like to give the floor to Dr. Mesut Erzurumluoğlu for a speech. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, so can you hear me well? Yes. Evet. Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Masoud, and I'm a uh, senior scientist in the relatively uh, newly established human genetics team of uh, Böhring Ingelheim, and we're located at the uh, the International Research Center in the in the beautiful city of Bibera in uh, South Germany. And uh, we're currently uh, building analysis pipelines to make use of uh, human genetics data to validate, uh, but sometimes more importantly, invalidate the company's uh, portfolio of drugs. And in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll, I'll mention some ideas here. And uh, before moving to Böhringer Ingelheim, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I've worked for around three years at the University of Cambridge. Uh, mainly working on the genetic uh, causes of metabolic diseases. And before that, I worked at the University of Leicester um, on the genetics of uh, smoking behavior and chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Um, so most of the findings I'll mention today will be uh, mostly from those years, so uh, end of 2015 to uh, end of 2018. And I believe one of my uh, supervisors from those years, um, Louise Vane, is also going to give a talk uh, late in the day. So I look forward to listening to her talk, but also quite a few of the other talks. And uh, and as you probably know, um, uh, Böhring Ingelheim is, is a leader in treating uh, uh, quite a few respiratory diseases. I think many of you will know, um, like Nintadenib, or, or, or no, also known as OFEV. So we are very interested in, in the research that goes on in this field. And, and I thank the organizers for kind of making our job easier. Uh, so um, I do have a disclosure. I, I work for Böhring Ingelheim. <clears throat> so um, as I'm the first speaker in this session, and I also had a look at the program, and I didn't see any kind of genetics related uh, talks there. So I wanted to kind of include a couple of slides on, on our genome. Um, so our genome is very long. Um, it's around uh, 3 billion base pairs long, in fact. And our code is made up of um, four different bases called adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And we inherit a 3 billion base pair long copy each from our parents. And if we could kind of line the two up together and compare the corresponding positions, we would see that they're around 99.9% .9 similar of the time, uh, but because our genome is very long, even that 0.1% corresponds to around uh, you know 3 million variants, and that's just comparing to individuals. If we extend these comparisons to the whole population, um, we'd see that there are hundreds of millions of variants in the population, and uh, most of those, uh, a large proportion of those variants are what we call uh, single nucleotide changes, and Quite a few of those are common, which we call uh, SNPs. Um, and a SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And these are relatively common um, uh, single base variants in a specific uh, position of the genome, uh, where uh, many individuals have uh, different alleles and therefore different genotypes. And where we see these uh, you know, um, common variants, common alleles, we would call that uh, uh, lo locus, that region, uh, a SNP. And of course, there are many types of variants uh, in, the, in the genome, so it's structural variants, short insertions, deletions, etc. But focusing on SNPs um, within the human genetics field was a pragmatic decision, statistically, but also uh, financially, logistically, etc. Um, but things are changing with sequencing becoming um, more and more cheaper, and uh, we'll have access to more and more um, rare variants, which will be uh, very important in their own way. But kind of sticking to uh, SNPs for now, um, once we identify the uh, genotypes of thousands of individuals at these SNPs po SNP positions uh, throughout the genome, um, we can then bring in some phenotypic data and carry out what we call genome-wide association studies. And for clarity, let's assume that every single position uh, every single person with an AA at this position does not smoke. So they've both inherited uh, an adenine from their parents. 
Um, every single person who has a, uh, a single G allele at this position uh, smokes, and every single person who has, a, a, who has inherited the guanine from both their parents at this position uh, smokes a lot. Then we wouldn't even need st statistics to see that the G allele is associated with uh, smoking. But of course, in reality, especially for complex traits like um, smoking behavior uh, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, individual SNPs can have very small effects. So you would need thousands, even uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, um, participants to identify uh, robust associations between uh, SNPs and these complex traits. And this is exactly what we did. So I was very fortunate to have contributed to these uh, papers of which uh, three of them are uh, large-scale genome-wide association studies. Um, the, the bottom right is, is, is a genome-wide association study on smoking behavior where we uh, use data from um, up to uh, 600 six, uh, 600,000 uh, individuals and also the other uh, papers um, published in Nature Genetics, which utilized, one of them utilized over 50,000 individuals and the other um, over 400,000 individuals. And through these genome-wide association studies, we more than doubled the number of associations for a lung function and chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. So in, a, in, in, in the... Um, in the first analysis, which we published in 2017, we increased the number of genetic associations um, for uh, lung function from 54 to 97. And then in a subsequent uh, analysis, which we published in 2019, we increased the number of uh, associations from 140 to 279. Um, and, and, and then uh, our genome-wide association study on uh, smoking behavior was also the largest uh, genome-wide association study at the time, where we almost quadrupled the number of uh, associations for smoking behavior. But it's later being trumped by a, a, a massive study later on, which I think uh, increased it to over 100 uh, genetic associations. Um, so just to say that we identified many associations between variants in the genome and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung function, and smoking behavior. So the genome is definitely uh, important in, in causing these, um, uh, these uh, complex traits. And, and the genome-wide association is just the beginning. So using different methods, uh, which I have no time to go into, but we can actually move from these genome-wide associations to causal variants, to causal genes, causal tissues, pathways. And even if we're lucky, we can actually identify uh, drug targets for these uh, traits. And there is this one method um, called Mendelian randomization, which if done well, um, actually if it can be done well, is like a cheat code to move from these associations to drug targets. And it's essentially an instrumental variable analysis which takes advantage of the fact that uh, genetic variants are usually not affected by confounding factors as uh, alleles are randomly inherited from the parents. And there is also no reverse causality as the inherited at uh, conception. And just to kind of make things a bit clear, I wanted to use the same paradigm and picking a relatively straightforward uh, example. Uh, I want to kind of move from the uh, GVAS association at 15Q25, which is uh, one of the first um, associations identified for smoking behavior. And I want to kind of move towards uh, a potential um, uh, preventive or therapeutic drugs for uh, COPD. So this uh, 15Q25 region, which uh, in encapsulates quite a few genes, and um, most famous ones are CHRNA3, CHRNA5, and CHRNB4. Uh, this region has the largest uh, effect known so far on smoking quantity. And I think it explains something like 1% uh, of the phenotypic variants. And that corresponded to around uh, one uh, cigarette uh, per day on average uh, per allele. And, and if we do some fine mapping, we might be able to find that uh, RS1051730 uh, SNP uh, and the A, A allele um, is, is, the, is the SNP with the um, highest posterior probability, uh, which 
then if you look into um, genetic uh, gene expression data sets like GTEx, we can find that this SNP decreases CHRNA expression in, in the brain cortex, which then increases smoking by uh, possibly uh, reducing aversive effects of smoking. Um, and then which then leads to increased uh, inflammation in the lung, um, abnormal cell repair, extracellular matrix destruction, etc., which then leads to obstruction, which then leads to chronic obstruction. Um, and uh, you, um, you can also see a similar paradigm working for PCSK9, um, so, uh, which is like, you know, very, very famous in, in, the, um, in the coronary artery disease uh, field. So you can actually um, f find a variant that uh, lowers PCSK9 levels um, in the blood, which then lowers LDL cholesterol, uh, which then um, lowers atherosclerosis risk, which then lowers uh, coronary artery um, disease risk. So, so the point I want to make is once the mechanism is known, it gives us uh, different opportunities to design a drug and intervene. So um, I'm not sure if you can see my, uh, uh, my point about uh, like we can take the prevention route and try and um, uh, target the, 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 the increased smoking um, stage. So maybe we can design a drug to increase um, expression of CHRNA5. Or we could try and slow progression by targeting the increasing inflammation um, stage. Um, or we could, um, for maybe uh, individuals at, at a later stage, we can um, uh, design drugs to actually treat the symptoms to kind of, um, uh, to maybe uh, um, uh, target the obstruction, um, uh, reverse the obstruction that these individuals have. And I want to kind of mention a few examples. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, during my uh, time in Leicester, we mainly worked on the genetics of lung function and chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. And I was tasked with following up on the associations that we identified and identifying potential uh, drug targets. Um, so to give one example of how we used uh, genetics, human genetics evidence to uh, validate a drug target uh, for chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease, um, I mapped one of the um, GWAS uh, associations to a, to a gene called CHRM3 uh, using the gene expression data sets. And, and um, having looked through the literature also, um, the mechanism um, of action was uh, clear. So the increase uh, in the expression of the gene caused exaggerated acetylcholine release, which then uh, enhanced the expression of downstream singling signaling uh, components in the uh, airway uh, smooth muscles, which then cause bronchoconstriction. Um, so the target made biological sense also. And then I que queried the, the drug target and clinical trial databases and found actually the protein uh, was already being targeted by uh, in inhibitors uh, like um, ipratropium uh, developed by Berhing Ingelheim. So, so this served as a validation um, uh, how human genetics, uh, how valuable human genetics can be uh, in validating drug targets. And in a later uh, genome-wide association study, we also identified potential uh, drug repurposing um, opportunities. And this was for, uh, for ITGAV, um, for um, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. So ITGAV in encodes an important component of an integrin. Um, that is being used as a target for a related uh, disease, um, pulmonary fibrosis. And we found ITGAV uh, via what we call co-localization analyses in the lung cells and found that there is already a molecule uh, developed by a GSK that mimics the effects, uh, effect of the variants um, that we identified. So there are um, uh, repurposing opportunities for COPD um, to, um, if, if, if this drug is, uh, proven to be safe and effective for pulmonary fibrosis. And we also identified possible side effects for a drug that's being used uh, in, a, in a clinical trial for systemic um, lupus erythematosus. So we used a fine mapping um, to uh, find a variant that is very likely to produce the same effect of a drug called atacicept. Uh, but we showed that possibly it will uh, reduce lung function as a side effect. So if the drug turns out to be efficacious and safe um, for uh, SLE, um, 
but uh, finding also turns out to be true, um, then you know benefits versus risk decisions uh, will have to be made. Um, and uh, I want to kind of finish off by mentioning that uh, there are also many caveats uh, to the findings that we make uh, in human genetics. So one is that uh, our analyses uh, may point to a certain protein or gene uh, as a potential target, uh, but other information, especially uh, biochemical and uh, clinical trial information, can be critical to invalidate them. Um, so, for example, we identified Rev3L um, as a potential target for smoking cessation uh, using colocalization methods. But we also found that it was a, a DNA polymerase, um, and DNA polymerase inhibitors ultimately, you know, cause uh, apoptosis and are used to uh, sometimes treat a number of uh, types of cancers. So it may not be a good idea as a smoking cessation um, drug target. Um, and kind of um, in, intervening um, um, with this uh, with this um, gene uh, in in the brain, and also many of the potential drug targets that we identified for COPD also turned out to be um, chemotherapy drugs or had side effects like carcinogenic effects in other studies. Um, so human genetics definitely can't work on its own. We would uh, we need um, uh, information from other fields also. Um, but it's definitely, it can definitely um, be a powerful source of evidence, a, a different line of evidence to um, validate, sometimes invalidate um, drug targets. So I hope I've shown you uh, in the limited amount of time I had um, that human genetics data can be uh, very powerful in unearthing novel biology, but also uh, identifying and validating uh, drug targets. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Erzurumluoğlu, for this um, breakthrough presentation. We will get the questions at the very end.